Welcome to a lesson on collecting data. In this lesson, we will distinguish between a population and a sample, categorize data as either qualitative or quantitative, identify the type of sampling method used, identify the potential bias in a statistical study, determine whether a statistical study is an experiment or observational study, and also classify the type of experimental study. For this lesson, we will look at examples as we define the new vocabulary. So for number one, a political scientist surveys 32 out of the current 106 representatives in a state's Congress. Of them, 18 said they were supporting a new education bill, 12 said they were not supporting the bill, and two were undecided. The first question is, what is the population of this survey? The population of a study is the group the collected data is intended to represent it is the entire group of objects or individuals of interest in the statistical study. So in this case, the population is all of the representatives in the state's Congress. Part B, what is the size of the population? The size is the size of the state's Congress, which is 106. What is the size of the sample? So a sample is a smaller subset of the entire population ideally one that is fairly representative of the whole population. So in this case, the size of the sample would be the number of representatives surveyed, which is 32. For part D, give the sample statistic for the proportions of voters surveyed who said they were supporting the education bill. A sample statistic is a value, average or percentage, calculated using the data from the sample. This is compared to a parameter. A parameter is a value, average or percentage, calculated using all of the data from a population. And because we have a sample, that's why we're finding the sample statistic. We're looking for the statistic that would give the proportion of voters surveyed who said they were supporting the education bill. That would be 18 out of 32, or as a fraction, 18 30 seconds which does simplify because 18 and 32 share a common factor of 2. The simplified sample statistic is 9 sixteenths. This also expresses as a decimal as well as a percentage. 9 divided by 16 is equal to 0 0.5625, which is equal to 56.25%. For part E, based on this sample, we might expect how many of the representatives to support the education bill. Well, we would expect 56.25% of the 106 representatives to support the education bill. So we need to find 56.25% of 106. We convert the percent to a decimal and multiply, which gives us 0 0.5625 times 106 which is equal to 59.625, which we need to round to the nearest whole number or nearest representative, which would be 60. So we might expect 60 representatives to support the education bill. I also want to mention that a survey of an entire population is called a census. So if the scientist was to survey all 106 of the representatives, that would be a census. The next several questions involve sources of bias. Let's review those. Sampling bias, when the sample is not representative of the population. Voluntary response bias, the sampling bias that often occurs when the sample is volunteers. Self-interest study, bias that can occur when the researchers have an interest in the outcome. Response bias, when the responder gives inaccurate responses for any reason. Perceived lack of anonymity, when the responder fears giving an honest answer might negatively affect them. Non-response bias, when people refusing to participate in the study can influence the validity of the outcome. And then we have loaded or leading questions, when the question wording influences the responses. Also a concern is the question order, where the order of the questions can change the result. So going back up to number two, the question is, should the mall prohibit loud and annoying music in clothing stores catering to teenagers? Notice in this case, the adjectives of loud and annoying 
portray a negative emotion, and therefore this is an example of a loaded or leading question. Number three, a survey asked people to report their actual income and the income they reported on their IRS tax form. This question has a perceived lack of anonymity where the responder fears giving an honest answer might negatively affect them. So for example here, if the person reported two different incomes, they might fear an IRS audit. Number four, the question is, should the death penalty be permitted if innocent people might die? The wording of this question is biased because nobody wants innocent people to die. And therefore, this is also another loaded or leading question. For number five, a college psychology professor uses advertisements to ask people to access a website to fill out a survey for his research. This is an example of voluntary response bias, which often occurs when the sample is volunteers. Only those volunteering are willing to go to his website, in this case, would be surveyed. The next two questions involve qualitative or quantitative data. Categorical or qualitative data are pieces of information that allow us to classify the objects under investigation into various categories. Quantitative data are responses that are numerical in nature and with which we can perform meaningful arithmetic calculations. Number six, in a study you ask the subjects their age in years. Is this qualitative or quantitative? Because we can perform meaningful calculations with the ages, this would be quantitative data. For example, we could determine the mean, median, and mode of the ages. So the ages would be quantitative data. For number seven, in a study, the data you collect is a letter grade from A through F. Again, is this qualitative or quantitative? I would classify the letter grades as categories and therefore the letter grades would be categorical or qualitative data. Someone might argue you could calculate the GPA where an A is four points, a B is three points, and so on, but based upon the given information, I would classify the letter grades as categories and therefore qualitative data. Numbers eight through 10 deal with observational studies or experiments. An observational study is a study based on observations or measurements while an experiment is a study in which the effects of a treatment are measured. So for number eight, the temperature on randomly selected days throughout the year was measured. The temperatures are measurements and therefore this is an observational study. Number nine, the hair color of shoppers at the mall were recorded. This is also an observational study. And then number 10, a group of students are told to listen to music while taking a test and the results are compared to a group not listening to music. This is an example of an experiment. This is an example of an experiment because the effects of a treatment are measured, where the treatment is listening to music. The next three questions ask about the type of sampling method. So looking below, a sampling method is biased if some members of a population have a smaller likelihood of being included in the sample than other members of the population. A random sample is one in which each member of the population has an equal probability of being chosen from a group. A simple random sample is one in which each member of the population and, and any group of members has an equal probability of being chosen. The natural variation of samples is called sampling variability. This is unavoidable and expected in random sampling and in large samples is not an issue. To help account for variability, polters might instead use a stratified sample. In stratified sampling, a population is divided into a number of subgroups or strata. Random samples are then taken from each subgroup with sample sizes proportional to the size of the subgroups in the population. A slight variation to this is cluster sampling, where in cluster sampling, again, the population is divided into subgroups or clusters, but then a set of subgroups are selected to be in the sample. So notice how for a stratified sample, samples are taken from each subgroup, whereas in cluster sampling, a set of subgroups are selected for the sample. And in systematic sampling, every nth member of the population is selected to be in the sample. Perhaps the worst type of sampling methods are convenience samples and voluntary response samples.
Convenience sampling is samples chosen by selecting whoever is convenient, and voluntary response sampling is allowing the sample to volunteer. So going back to number 11, in a study, the sample is chosen by separating all cars by size and randomly selecting 10 of each size grouping. What is the sampling method? This is an example of stratified sampling, where again the population is divided into a number of subgroups, and then random samples are then taken from each subgroup, with sample sizes proportional to the size of the subgroups in the population. So again, this is stratified sampling. Number 12, in a study, the sample is chosen by dividing all students into groups, then randomly selecting three of the groups. What is the sampling method? So this is different for number 11 because once they're divided into groups, for number 12, they're selecting three of the groups, whereas in number 11, they were selecting randomly from each group. So number 12 is an example of cluster sampling, where again the population is divided into subgroups and then a set of subgroups are selected to be in the sample. So number 12 is cluster sampling. And number 13, in a study, the sample is chosen by pulling 50 names from a hat. What is a sampling method? This is an example of random sampling. Okay, number 14, a team of researchers is testing the effectiveness of a new HPV vaccine. They randomly divide the subjects into two groups. Group 1 receives a new HPV vaccine, and Group 2 receives the existing HPV vaccine. The patients in the study do not know which group they are in. Part A, what is the treatment group? So looking below, when using a control group, the participants are divided into two or more groups, typically a control group and a treatment group. The treatment group receives the treatment being tested. The control group does not receive the treatment. So in this case, the treatment group would be the group receiving the new vaccine, which is group one. For part B, what is the control group? The control group is a group not receiving the new vaccine, which would be group two. But I do want to mention, notice how the group is receiving treatment, they're receiving the existing vaccine, and therefore, they're better described as the comparison group. So in some cases, it is more appropriate to compare to a conventional treatment than a placebo, where a placebo is a dummy treatment. For example, in a cancer research study, it would not be ethical to deny any treatment to the control group or to give a placebo treatment. In this case, the currently accepted medicine would be given to the second group called the comparison group. So again, group two is the control group, but they could also be called the comparison group. For part C, is this study blind, double blind, or neither? A blind study is one in which the participant does not know whether or not they are receiving the treatment or placebo. A double blind study is one in which neither the participants nor those interacting with the participants know who is in the treatment group or who is in the control group. So in this case, we don't have enough information to determine whether the study is double blind, but we do know it is blind because the patients in this study do not know which group they are in. So we'll answer this by saying the study is at least blind. We do not have enough information to determine whether the study is double blind. For part D, is this best described as an experiment, controlled experiment, or a placebo controlled experiment? We know it's an experiment because we're measuring a treatment. We also know it's a controlled experiment because there's a control group and a treatment group. Let's check to see if we have a placebo controlled experiment. Before we do that, let's talk about the placebo effect. The placebo effect is when the effectiveness of a treatment is influenced by the patient's perception of how effective they think the treatment might be. So as a result, might be seen even if the treatment is ineffective. A placebo is a dummy treatment given to control for the placebo effect. If an experiment gives a control group a placebo, it is called a placebo controlled experiment. Well, this is not our case because the control group is receiving the old treatment, 
not a placebo, and therefore this is best described as a controlled experiment. And for our last example, for number 15, a teacher wishes to know whether the males in his or her class have more conservative attitudes than females. A questionnaire is distributed assessing attitudes. For part A, is this a sampling or census? We will assume the teacher gives the questionnaire to all of his or her students, and therefore this is a census. For part B, is this an observational study or an experiment? Whenever a questionnaire is given, we always have an observational study. For part C, are there any possible sources of bias in this study? Well, there's always sources of biases in a study. So if we go back to our sources of bias, all these biases should be considered when conducting a survey. I hope you found this helpful.